cheese sandwiches? Cucumber. Cucumber. All it's, right. It's tea, you know. All right. This is Ken Schneer, a wonderful friend, a wonderful critic and writer who has just published Anthems Outside Time and Other Strange Voices, a collection of short stories. So this is uh, got about 26 stories in it, all written between, or public, originally published between 2008 and 2017. It's my second collection. The, uh, all but two of the stories are previously published. Two of them are, two of them are new. It's, um, it's called And Other Strange Voices because I, as Sarah can attest, um, I tend to do a lot of odd things with, with voicing um, in my stories. It's, it's, it's uh, kind of a habit. Uh, I don't, don't do it every single time, but I do it a lot. And I wrote this whole piece on John Scalzi's blog um, last week where I try to justify this. Um, and it was a brilliant piece. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, you're very kind. Um, and I, but, I, but I think I think I actually believe that. I think I actually believe all that. Um, I think it's, I mean, the part about my training and what, the way I feel about constitutive rhetoric, that's all true. Um, and so trained as a lawyer. Say again? You are trained as a lawyer for I am trained as a lawyer. people who don't know you. And you're now an academic. Yes. So I'm, I'm a lawyer originally uh, by training. I stayed in practice only a few years and then got the hell out and uh, became an academic, uh, became a, um, a professor at the time, professor of business law um, to undergraduate business students. And there were a lot of academic changes uh, to our college over the last, well, it's been 30 years. Um, and in the last 10 of those years, I have been a professor of humanities, which still includes the business law classes, but now also includes the class in science fiction literature, the class in the honors seminar in Shakespeare, the class in introductory formal logic, the constitutional law class for the political science students, and the criminal procedure course for the criminal justice students. <laughs> Um, I actually have training in all these things, um, believe it or not. Um, I mean, the science fiction part, obviously, you know. Um, but everything else, I, I was a theater major in college. I've been, mm -hmm. you know, I've been reading and watching Shakespeare. Not, I am sure, as assiduously as Sarah has, but, but um, certainly a great deal. Um, and you've, you've acted too, haven't you? I have acted. I was a, I was a theater major. I was actually very briefly working for the, what was then called the New Jersey Shakespeare Festival. It's now called the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. Um, my one professional acting role, I played Fleance in Macbeth. <laughs> as in fly, good Fleance, fly, fly, fly. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, did you see Catherine Azaro posted today that she's trying to read Macbeth and she hates it? Um, she's not the only one. Yes, I did see. Yeah. Um, kind of wanted to write a very lengthy rebuttal essay, but, you know, first of I all... Have, yeah. I have to say that it was the Scottish play that got me into Shakespeare because I was reading Shakespeare at seven years old. Uh-huh. Um, which is not the time necessarily to read Shakespeare. That boy, it was just like Stephen King. <laughs> there were ghosts. There was, there were people killing each other. Boy, that was fun. Witches, murder, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you've come to read us something. I've come to read you something. I'm trying. I figure I ought to read, you know, from the collection since, since uh, this is yeah. still that relatively brief period during the, um... all right, well, let me read a little from Confinement. This is one you haven't read before. One of the problems with reading from this collection is that Sarah has read practically every story in it, 
including including the the ones that were not previously published. Um, but we are both members of the Cambridge Speculative Fiction Workshop. Right. So we read a lot of each other's stuff. Um, and since this 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 uh, covers the last twelve years, and ten of those years I've been in that group with Sarah. <laughs> Right, there's a lot of overlap, but this one, I, th I think I wrote before I joined the group. I, I, I will not, I think, well, I might read the whole thing. Um, I'm liking the use of language in it, so I'll mm -hmm. do it. And this is, um, I will say about this, the story is called Confinement. And it was prompted by a visit to the Uffizi. Um, 25 years ago and although I didn't write the story until like 2009 and after it was published it got me into the last place I would ever think to publish which is was an anthology of Christian speculative literature and Mysterion Mysterion and being being for one thing a Jew uh, and for another thing, not religious in any case, it was very surprising, but, but, um, there it was. Mr. Ann, by the way, is a wonderful anthology series. Fabulous. Um, Absolutely and, fabulous. Editors are wonderful people. They're, the, the stuff they choose is generally quite good. Anyway, so very, I'm very proud to have been in that anthology, just surprised. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I might not read all of it, but I'll read a lot of it. So this is called Confinement. Um, ought I give content or, tr content or trigger warnings? Um, uh, there's a little, there's, a, there's, there's, there's uh, some nasty stuff in it. Um, there's some sexual violence and there's uh, infanticide. <laughs> so you're warned. Okay, Confinement. Okay. She first saw him while she was taking the long way to work to avoid the deformed children. For anybody else, the walk between South Station and the looming tower that enclosed the law firm would be a nearly straight line, due north, 15 minutes at most. But Tamara stopped treading that narrow path after the first time she attempted it because she discovered that it required her to come face to face with St. Drogo's Infirmary for Waifs. It wasn't the building that hurt, it was the children. She had encountered St. Drogo's at the same moment as a mother with a cleft palate toddler emerged, and through the open front door, she had also caught a glimpse of the, tw of the twisted back on a five-year-old. In her imagination, the dark building was bursting with lame, drooling, incontinent, gaping idiots, all children, all demanding attention and understanding, all needing her. Nausea had almost overcome her and she hurried north to the protection of her own sterile cell at Rheingold, Granada and Pierce. When she found herself unable to get its name out of her head, Tamara looked up St. Drogo's. The resolute brownstone clinic had had its genesis a hundred years ago to care for children no one wanted, who were so awful to look at that adults condemned them. Nowadays, it also treated crack babies and infants born with AIDS and even had a licensed adoption agency to place the many children who were abandoned on the doorstep. That was all Tamara needed to know. She promised herself she'd never see the place again. So it was, at the blinding break of Midsummer's Day, that she was taking the long way, the extra five blocks in the utter southern corner of downtown, when she passed him on the street. He stood motionless in a cream-colored suit, frozen as he bent to pay a seated news seller, but his head jerked up and he glared into her face as if Tamara's glance had pulled him a string his golden hair twisted back out of his face, glinted fiercely in the merciless sun. His skin was polished and sallow, yet with a blush at the cheeks, 
small mouth and smaller down pointing nose, delicate, impossibly delicate hands. He stared at her unsmiling, appraising, ruthless, taking the breath out of her. She almost stopped, almost acknowledged him. Then she hurried on. That was the first time. On the first chill day of autumn, he appeared again at the blustery Saturday farmer's market near the North End as Tamara was looking for apples. His thin, strong fingers stacked pomegranates on a table, a white and gold apron constraining him. The cool air made his skin look waxen. The breeze did not stir his hair. He looked up from the red speckled fruit and said, you are well favored. She thought his voice was masculine, but only barely so. And she had the irrational feeling that she, he hadn't actually made a sound. When she tried later to recall the timbre of that voice, nothing came. Again, his face was solemn, intent, imperious. His eyes burned into her. She could not answer, but turned away and went to find, instead of apple, some bitter watercress or radishes. When it came time to pay the other vendor for them, as far from the golden man as she could manage, involuntarily she looked back in his direction. He wasn't there. The third time, a foot of snow hid lakes of slush that splashed on her calves as she sought refuge in the city mall on the east side. Breathing more easily indoors, she strode through saccharine pipe music, What Child Is This? and the Coventry Carol, until she reached the electronics shop to find a replacement battery for her phone. As she looked up from the endless shelf, he materialized, standing in the aisle, and it was impossible to tell whether he was a salesman or just another customer. His left hand drooped, holding a thin software package between two fingers. His right finger was raised, pointed skyward, but tilted in her direction. Again, he did not smile. Again, she feared his face would suck her in. You are so fortunate, if only you knew, he said and his voiceless voice seemed to come from the shelves and the ceiling and the floor. And that was when she realized who he was. Her breath caught in her throat. She dropped her package. She fled the store. Her heart did not stop pounding until she reached the cafe across the street from the mall. And there she downed the strongest, hottest coffee she could find, scalding her throat as she tried to breathe tried to be sensible, tried to talk herself out of what had to be a hallucination. She knew that face. Five years ago, the trip before law school to help her forget what had happened in college. The Uffizi in August, practically, practically the only thing open during Faragusto, the Feast of the Assumption, when all of Italy seemed to come to a halt. She'd walked in silence, the relative cool of the long galleries, hiding from the oppressive Florentine heat, hearing her footsteps talk back to her. Then she'd stopped in front of the tempera on wood panels, 700 years old, and the city had warped around her, snapped the way a rubber cap will snap itself back into shape after being forcibly inverted. The sign told her, it was Simone Martinez Annunciation, 1333. The image was heavy with gold, gold so overwhelming that it made the figure's skin look gray and dark as if they were in the last stages of a wasting illness, though their flesh was plump and smooth. There was Gabriel in flowing robes a pope might have worn, his cloak surging behind him as in an infernal wind, his wings raised powerfully like a bird of prey, kneeling, but also leaning aggressively, his hand raised in a gesture of command, his face intent, insistent, pitiless, golden. There was Mary, clad in black, 
her shoulders turned away from the imperious angel, her head unwillingly yanked back towards him, her eyes narrowed, her mouth in a scowl of mistrust and even loathing. There, unbelievably, were Gabriel's words in gold shooting across the room from his head to Mary's like the bullets of a machine gun. Ave, gratia, plena, dominus, tecum, hail, O highly favored, the Lord is with you. But the virgin did not feel highly favored, and the Lord was being forced upon her. Her hand still clutched the book she had been reading. Her other hand was raised protectively to her throat, as if it would help, as if she had a choice, as if anything could save her. Wisely, the artist had left out Gabriel's next words, in which he will tell her that she is pregnant, whether she will or no, that she has been taken by God, as Leda was taken by the swan, as Europa was taken by the bull, that she must live to flee her home and shame her husband, that she must watch her son be torn and broken, that through all of this, she must remember she is blessed, like a branding iron. Martini's cruel Gabriel, an angry Mary, pressed and seared into Tamara's brain, never to be healed. For years it roused her from dreams of nausea, flashed before her eyes when she let her attention wander, appeared on television screens in the place of static. Every once in a while, once a month, or was it only when the season changed, the Annunciation would appear with seeming innocence on a postcard in a gift shop in a book on the high middle ages, a page in a calendar, even weirdly on a sitcom. Each time it shocked her, made her turn the other way, made her want to run a virgin's wrathful, fearful, doomed gray face. And now this man, this angel, this creature manifested on earth to pursue her. She slept badly for the next three months walking in a sweat with tears carving her face like stigmata. Food seemed too strongly flavored, and when she did manage to swallow, she was likely to vomit it back up. Her doctors ran an encyclopedia of tests, all negative. Shivering as she left the clinic, she wondered why she bothered. Man's medicine could not minister to a diseased soul. On the coming of the vernal equinox, Tamara spent the morning working in the country courthouse, excuse me, the county courthouse on the western edge of town. Within this temple to man's law and the incarnation of his passions, she felt safe. When she filed her last batch of, then she filed her last batch of papers and headed for the door, and he was there. This time he wore the raiment of the courthouse police a holstered pistol at his side, but impossibly young and horribly ancient at the same time. Another lawyer bleeped through the scanner and the tall blonde put his hand on the man's arm. He said gravely, no one gets through here until they get past me. And then he turned to Tamara, his eyes widening and said, not even her. Stifling a scream, she hurried down the steps and out into the plaza, trying to remember the way back to her office. But she did not make it back to the office, did not escape him this time. He appeared on the sidewalk in front of her, and as she turned sharply into an alley to avoid him, there he was again. The stern golden man gave her no escape. His narrow eyes seared her face and bared her heart. Memories from which she had run and hidden now came streaming at her, an arrow straight line from him to her. The college party, the vodka and cocaine on the table, half hidden by smoke and flashing lights, the spinning room, the moving floor soiled and wet, the stumble up the stairs with the strong hand on her arm, the heavy lacrosse player who did not hear her refusal, did not stop, did not listen as she wept and screamed in pain, the blackness like a suffocating cloak thrown over her head. And then the months in hiding, the lost semester, the lost summer, the hotel rooms and hostels, bad food and vile smells, the long coats and hanging dresses that hid everything from anyone who didn't look too closely. And then 
she fought against the memory. But the pitiless golden thing would no more listen to her refusals in the lacrosse player than the swan or the bull would have listened. Then the night alone, driven in a borrowed car over rocky ground to a forsaken hill in the woods, her cries, her blood, her shit upon the earth among the trees and the wail of the child. And then, and then she had walked away. As soon as she could wrench herself to her feet, walked away alone, left the child to the wind and the cold and the beasts, exposed it as the Romans would have exposed a deformed infant or a mouth they could not feed. She left it there in the woods, retreated, stumbling, listened to its cries until she was far enough away that her own cries drive, drowned them out. Now the tears poured down like blood, her eyes burned, her hair burned, her belly was on fire. Gabriel, if that's who it was, grimaced in agony at her, as her humiliation, shame, and guilt swam to the surface like boils. He opened his mouth and a cry came out. It was the cry of the infant in the woods and her, was her own cry and Mary's. What could he want of her now? What was his purpose? To torture her with memories she could not forgive, with the crime from which she had run every day of her life? Is that why he had sought her out? No, she knew better. Gabriel always wanted something of Mary. No, was telling her something, imposing on her the duty she could not escape. You are highly favored, no matter that the favor tears you into a hundred pieces. The Lord is with you, whether you want him or not. What do you want? What do you want? She asked, trying to sound stern, but whimpering as she spoke. Blessed mother, said Gabriel, nostrils flaring, his teeth sharp. No, said Tamara. Blessed among all women, said Gabriel. What can I do? Turn myself in? Plead guilty to murder? Is that what you want? Then will you leave me alone? The angel turned his head to, on one side. Then the other, like a bird looking through one eye at a time. Atonement before man is not atonement before God. Tamara wanted to run at him, to sink her nails into his flesh, to do anything that would make him go away. But he came closer, his eyes wide like a madman's. Then what, what, what? He turned his head on its side again, but this time the gesture meant follow. He strode out of, the, out of the alley, seeming to leave it all at once. Unable to stop herself, she hurried after. He walked slowly or seemed to. His steps came down only once every several heartbeats, yet he moved through space as quickly as she could run. She did not see him glide nor perceive any moment when his strides appeared larger than any man's, but he covered the ground like a bounding lion. She found herself dodging traffic, cutting through alleys, stumbling over spoiled food and refuse, losing all sense of where she was. Her breath came in buzzing, sickly wheezes, and bright spots bloomed in front of her eyes when they finally stopped. She leaned against a brownstone wall and shut her eyes, hugging herself and trying not to pass out. Then she looked up. They were standing in front of St. Drogo's infirmary for waifs. It loomed over her like a hungry giant. Her heart struck blows against her chest. She glared at the inhuman master before her. He bowed her he his head, but would not release her eyes. Give what was taken. His voice rang in her head. Take what was lost. She could not move. She knew what was inside. The children too maimed and wounded to endure, the abandoned, the doomed. She could not turn away. She could not refuse. Redemption was here, even if it burned her. He released her as she climbed the mount of stairs and the air turned golden around them. That's the end.
can see why the uh, Christian Journal wanted it. Yeah. yeah. Ease what you got, you know. <laughs> Very Brilliant. well done. Brilliant. Yeah. I don't normally get a chance. I'm, maybe I shouldn't say chance. I normally don't write stuff where it seems appropriate to go pedal to the metal on the metaphor, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but this one kind of cried out for it. That's why I really pulled out all the stops. I think there's like references and cross references like in every every sentence. I mean, even pardon me. <laughs> even her um, the four times she sees him on Midsummer's Day, the vernal equinox, Midwinter's Day, and how many equinox are to the south, to the north, to the east, and to the west. Yeah. Crossing yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are also the, um, the it's Christmas. Um, Those two particular the characters. Annunciation. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, the, the Annunciation really did make a huge impression on me when I when I when I, when I, when I, when I, saw it. I just I was just I was just flabbergasted. It was really it was really the words that were yeah I know what you mean head to head going right across it and it, and it really did seem weapon like to me. It seemed like I used the term the story machine gun and that's kind of what it felt like to me like the words coming across mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. machine gun. Um, it, uh, you know, and of course I'm talking 1333, so what do you mean machine gun? Um, but, but. But they knew about arrows, they knew about swords, yeah, they, yeah. they knew about, um. Yeah. And, and I'm, I read later on that there are other, there are other hostile looking Virgin Marys, Virgins Mary in, um, in, in other scenes of the Annunciation. Um, mm -hmm. that it, apparently it's not all that uncommon to, to represent Mary is not really happy about the news, um, which is cool. This, you know. this was part of what I studied as an undergraduate and very definitely there are apocryphal stories of her refusing and objecting in various ways. Like you would, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, leave me out of this one. <laughs> um. And and then she she ends up doing something which to her is viscerally um, impossible, frightening. Yeah, yeah. She does she does what she can't do. She does what she can't do, and then of course when she when she does it, she'll realize that she can. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Which happens to Mary too. Yeah. Anyway, so it was a, you know, it was a, when I, when, when I go, when I go really, really short, I'm able to sometimes write the entire first draft in one sitting. And um, you get a, you get a feeling sometimes like you're kind of on, um, almost in a trance. I wanted to say on fire, but 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 in, in in a trance where the stuff, it's almost like you're a conduit. Yeah. Um, and I think there are maybe four stories in here, where I kind of had that feeling, you know. Where, and you wrote this thing all in one draft. Oh my gosh. Say again. You wrote this thing all in one draft. I think the first. I know. First I, draft, I don't know for the first draft, I think I I was gonna say I were all all in one sitting. I think. Mm. And then I th they were definitely revisions because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, one thing I realized, all the, all the language opportunities there were in the, in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I should do more of that. I mean, I have, I have a story, um, not in this collection, called Conflagration, where I use fire imagery like, you know, every third line, um, mm -hmm. because there's a lot about fire in it. And that was just really satisfying just from the standpoint of sheer, just of the, the sheer joy of the writing. Mm 
Mm. Um, I find it harder, and I think it's normal to find it harder when you're writing more naturalistic scenes where you've got people talking in ordinary dialogue. You know, what, what is it Bert Le Guin says in um, from Elf, Elf, Elfland of Poughkeepsie? Mm. You know, um, certain kinds of human interactions just can't withstand that level of language because it feels utterly unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, here, it felt, it felt totally natural. Yeah. Um, it, it made me think of what the same story or the, uh, the successor story would be like from the point of view of the of a kid at St. Drago's, mm. of mm. a kid that she, that she adopts. And then it made me think about, uh, I wonder if Jesus ever picked up something like that from his mother. Mm. Hmm. But I really, I really want to to write that story of the person who is adopted out of out of obligation and fear and knows it. Mm. Right, right. Rather than out of desire. Out and, of desire. Out of, uh, out of out of out of love. Out of love, looking for an object. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Of course, I don't know what she's going to do next. I mean, no. one of the one of the one of the beauties of the short story as a form. I think I was saying this the other the other night. Um, um, I think a lot like somebody in the, in the theater. And the way I think I figure it, the set only has to be painted as far off stage as the audience can see. Mm -hmm. Right. And. And once you get beyond the point where the viewers, it doesn't matter what it looks like. And so I can't tell you how many times I've had people ask me questions about the world in which my characters are acting out or the histories of the characters or other things. And I kind of, I have no idea. Yeah. You know, I have no idea because none of that was necessary for the four corners of this story. Mm -hmm. um, when, I wonder uh, if I wonder if that's a difference between the short story and the novel. I think it might because be. In the novel, you get to be able to see around the corners of the world mm -hmm. mm. and to, to know things that the characters don't, don't know because there's this big, this big chunky world mm -hmm. behind them. Yeah, and I think you do that to a little bit, to, to some extent in the short story mm -hmm. too, but, but much, 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 much less. Yeah. Um, All you have to do is is know that it's not going to um, actually be something that doesn't work within the world of the story. Right. And of course, that can sometimes really mess you up because you will, you'll write, um, you'll realize that you need piece of information X that you did not previously have. You'll need... Mm -hmm. Um, uh, information about somebody's birthday or about their job or about what's on the next street. You don't realize till you get there. And since you haven't done a whole hell of a lot of rigorous world building, mm -hmm. you have to backfill it in. And sometimes it gets, it, it fits in clunky because oh. it wasn't natural. It was stuck on mm -hmm. because you needed something there. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I've, you know, I've seen those things in my own work, you know, um, happen where I've put something in there and it, 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 it kind of fits right, sort of, you can push it. Um, but, but it's not organic because it wasn't part of the original vision. But, but, but I couldn't tell the story without it. Um, well, that's, that's the fun of doing first draft because you say, oh, well, there ought to be something. And right. um, I'll just clap it in there as though it were in the draft before this. And, um, and sometimes I, it works really well. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it does. And you say, oh, I didn't have to explain that afterwards. But 
I've started, now that I'm writing fantasy, I've started putting little notes in the margin and saying, um, do I have to establish this beforehand? And then I go through afterwards and say, yeah, really, really better um, put that in beforehand or nah. Once had a, um, a prominent editor uh, reject a story, which was not too long after accepted and published by a different prominent editor. But prominent editor number one said something to me, which I think a lot of writers would, ha would have jumped at, right? He said, I don't want this particular story, but I love this situation and I love these characters. If you ever write another story with these two characters in it, Ooh. I want you to show it to me first, right? A very, very flattering thing to say in a rejection letter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, I'm very happy, but my mind just doesn't work that way. I mean, I mean, I, I had gotten to the end of the story, and from my perspective, that whole world had ended. Right? You were done with those characters at that with, point. Yeah, done with I, that world. I had done, I had said this very final thing, you know, at the end of the story, designed to be like centuries worth of perspective and backing away and putting like the last, one of the best last lines I ever wrote. And um, it's the story is called The Plausibility of Dragons. It's in here. Um, such a good yeah. And great, a great um, last line. I was really happy with it. And after that last line, you want me to write the sequel? <laughs> I mean, the yeah, line that, that story was done. Yeah, that's what I think. Well, that's, that's one of the things I like so much about your work is that you have these wonderful shards of worlds and they're so suggestive and they're so th uh, potential, but you just skim the perfect amount of cream from them or the perfect amount of broken glass and then there doesn't, there doesn't need to be any more. But, but, I, but I sort of, um, I mean, I, I understand the impulse though. I mean, I understand mm -hmm. the, the sequel impulse. I certainly, even though I really hate it that people are kind of pushed into, into writing series these days, series and trilogies, I certainly have exper experienced the desire to read more in this world with these characters when I'm uh, when I finish a really good book, mm. you know, um, and more often than not, the sequels disappoint me. Yeah, you know, because I don't get the thrill. You know, sometimes it's a, it, a series has a long arc and it builds towards something, and the something it builds towards builds towards is so delicious that okay, you know. I'm able to, I'm able to, to see my way through to this, but, but uh, a lot of the time, a lot, I have read a lot of books that are the first books of series and really adored them and never read the second book. Mm. Yeah, just. There's the, the freshness and newness of the world. And yeah. um, when you go back to it, it isn't as fresh and it isn't as, you, know, you have to do something really, really different or, um, it just doesn't feel as good. I think Noreen Johnson. Hey, do you read her? Um, I don't. I may have read one or two pieces, but I don't think I have read a lot. She's she's actually published as a YA author, mm -hmm. and she does trilogies, and she does them by setting up this wonderful world and then breaking it at the end of the first mm. book, and and then she builds on the shards of the world and does something different with it and breaks it at the end of the second volume. Mm. And so that you're always um, unbalanced and there's always something new. She, she did uh, a trilogy called Shades of London, beginning with a book called The Name of the Star, which is just brilliant. Um, 
and she she brought in major new characters in the third volume, hmm. and they were at the end of the third volume they wanted to do more stuff, and then the trilogy ends. So there's that that sense of hmm. it's. It's again shards of worlds, but she's doing it at neither light. I think I find it satisfying when sequels or, tril or trilogies aren't exactly continuations, where you'll actually move to a whole different group of characters or a whole different location. So, you know, Paladin, Paladin of Souls was for me enormously satisfying as a quote sequel, end quote, to Curse of the Curse of Chalion. Yeah. Be because even though it, I guess, technically is a sequel and that it's, this, it's, it's the same world, some of the same characters in, later in time, it isn't really at all. It's because mm -hmm. it's the, the fish it has to fry are completely different. Yeah. than in that book and the concerns are different and the, 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 the worries and problems of the characters are different. It needn't even really have been in the same world, actually. She could have pulled it off just as well in a different world. That it was fun. Now, interestingly, I happened to read, and this is a bad habit of mine, I happened to read that, 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 uh, that duology backwards. Huh. I read uh, Paladin of Souls first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and had heard so much about it and then read Curse of Chalion. Um, and this is something I've discovered, really good, really good story sequences. The order doesn't actually matter. Doesn't matter so much, no. Can... She does that with the Hayley Porkozikin series too. Um, let's have a different world, let's have different characters. We usually have Miles and Ipanel always. And the um, the concerns and the tone of the books are so different. Now, Marge Piercy will pull that off all in one book. Yeah. Right, she'll give you a book like um, City of Darkness, City of Light, or um, Gone to Soldiers, where mm -hmm. you have anywhere from eight to 15 point of view characters and you'll sometimes actually see the same event twice. Yeah. Uh, from, uh, and of course, when she does it that way, it's because she wants you to see that from these two points of view, it's in no way, shape or form the same event. Right. Uh, and, um, yeah, because so. narrative is one, narrators are wonderful, point of view is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I apologize for. Oh, hi, Robin. Hi, I'm sorry. I I'm, I missed everything. I'm sure. I'm I'm so sorry. I got totally involved in trying to send a birthday greeting to my granddaughter. Ah, and, um, that's important. How old is your granddaughter? She'll be 18 to uh, day after tomorrow. Oh, marvelous. Yes. Big one. That's a big one. Yeah, a big one. It's tough to be 18 in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, well, she also graduated from high school in the middle of the pandemic. Sure. But is handling it well. You're on mute, Zara. I was trying to say that today is my son's 28th birthday. Oh, uh, happy so. birthday, Sergey. Happy birthday to him. <laughs> Did I miss you reading, Sarah? Did, did no, you? No, uh, Ken was reading. I was reading. Okay. I will. I will I read tomorrow. From this book. Read. Yes, Anthem's Outside Time, a brilliant, wonderful book. Just Is it out. science fiction? Yes, it's a science fiction and fantasy and a little horror. <laughs> what we call it? speculative fiction. You would like it, rather. Political spectacle yeah. stories. Definitely would. Mm -hmm. Very, very good use of language and imagery. Yeah. Thank you. Can't wait. Is it, is it going to be on, the reading going to be on YouTube? <laughs> yes, it is. And anytime, anytime soon? Readings. Anytime soon? Uh, as soon as I can get around to it, which should be really soon now, as soon as uh -huh. it stops being quite so hot. I will, okay. and I will link, I will link to it on my 
brand spanking new website. Exactly, uh, which, which is which has Ken, Ken Schneier dot com. Ken Schneier dot com. One, one word, and mm -hmm. it has um, I now have a, have a media page, and I put both of the previous two readings. On oh, good. That, on, on, on that uh, media page, as well as, do you remember, you might not remember, I don't think we knew each other then, my Kickstarter campaign back in 2010, uh, we hadn't met, I don't think at that was point. It, was it for the first anthology? Uh, no, it was actually for, uh, it was actually just to fund the writing of, so there was no, there was no good reason for it. Huh. I, I had heard of, I had heard of Kickstarter and I wanted to try using it and see what mm -hmm. happened. So, I included the video, which is enormously silly. It's called, uh, <laughs> Are You the Agent or the Controller? is the name of the video. And I have Daikaiju music uh, uh, playing uh, th throughout, throughout it. And I have my kids in it. And I have, um, I have, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very silly. Um, <laughs> and a little embarrassing at this, at this distance, but I had fun watching it anyway. I actually laughed. I should put my videos up on my web page. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Cobbled together by me, which means, you know, I, 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 I emailed Matt Kressel thinking maybe he would give me some useful advice, you know, and Matt said, ah, it's WordPress. All you got to do is use their tools. Huh. <laughs> I use Weebly because, um, Augustine Burroughs uses it for his secondary um, thing, which is doing photography. Hmm. And Augustine said, Weebly is so easy and it's mostly easy. Thank you for reading. Thank you for being such a marvelous writer. And hold up your book again, kenschneyer.com. Kenschneyer.com, but this one you can pick up at, Fair, at, at Fairwood Press. Hmm. You can get it via a hard copy via the publisher, and you can get it certainly in Kindle form and Kobo form and all those other forms. But um, thank you, everybody, for for coming to 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 um, be here for the reading. Thanks for the chat. Thanks, Sarah, for inviting me and for being such a good pal. Thank you. Thank Ken. you for reading. <laughs>